Okay, we stopped with this question here. Okay, if PTK from Indo-European to Germanic languages, yeah, in Germanic languages turned to f, f, ch, the voiceless plosives were gone. Okay, so where where do they come from? I mean, we still have them. We'll consider a word like pipe, okay, or apple, or some of this. I mean, there are voiceless plosives. Time, okay. Where do they come from? Now, um, the thing is, if something like this happens, okay, that a whole system or say a whole class of sounds yeah, uh, is replaced by another, in this respect, voiceless um, plosives by the corresponding fricatives, they leave a void, okay? They leave a certain gap in the system. And this usually is filled in, and that's the thing. Okay, a language can't do without voiceless plosives. So yes, they are. They have to come from somewhere, and this is what happens. Okay, here you see uh, that the voiced plosives, the Indo-European voiced plosives, in Germanic languages, they become or they are made voiceless, which means b turns into p, and d into t, and g into k. Okay, this is also part of Grimm's law. Okay, voiceless, turn into fricatives, the voiced plosives into voiceless plosives. Um, examples. I mean, it's always best to show you a few instances here. Uh, we have this, the first one again. Yeah, Latin, we had this before. Pedem. Yeah, and there you see uh, uh, tut. No, it should read foot. Okay, it should read foot. I mean, sometimes, I mean, these things happen. Okay, you can see this foot. So p turns into f and d into t. Okay, German fools, we come to that later on. Or take Latin labium, well, which you still have in labiodental fricatives, for example. Yeah, lip, labium, labium turns into lip, b into p. Okay, loan words, of course, still have it. We said that, la, labiodental. Okay. Quad Latin, okay, into um, English what, okay, so de into t, German, later on, thus we come to that. Or uh, take that here, decem, yeah, decem, de into t, ten, okay, ten, decem. Yeah. In German, you still see the K, yeah, Zichen, yeah, which, of course, is not pronounced anymore, but there it's still spelled, okay, with the H, okay, well, the K, K, turned into H. Um, dent, okay, oh, labiodental, I mean, we go through all the phonetics here, yeah, labiodental, dent, tooth, D, T, okay, tooth, German, Zahn, okay, or Aga, okay, agriculture, there you still have the g, okay, in a foreign word, aga into acre, g, k, yeah, g into k, and duo into two today, two, okay, two, duo, two, d, t. And for completion's sake here, a Greek word, I said sometimes I will, will use Greek examples as well, yeah, hydro, which you still find in hydraulic, yeah, things like that, uh, turns into water, t, yeah, door, water, okay, wasser, okay. All right, uh, uh, so yes, the voice, voiced plosives fill in the gap that is left uh, by the voiceless plosives turning fricatives, okay? And then the question is, of course, where do the voiced plosives come from? In Germanic languages, we still have them, okay? Hmm? Of course, uh, booth, okay, boy, some of this, it's still there, it's still there, okay? And uh, here's the explanation that Indo-European had aspirated voiced plosives, b, d, g, okay? And they are 
unaspirated and then turn into b de g and this b de g. They die out because we don't have them anymore in Germanic languages, of course. Uh, um, just a few examples for completion's sake, but uh, they won't mean uh, they. Yeah, uh, there is an Indo-European word. Must have been yeah, duer. Something like this, duer, duer. Very difficult to pronounce for us. Yeah, so an aspirated, um, voiced plosive duer. To, door today in English, no aspiration. We don't have aspirated voiced plosives. Yeah, baram bear. Okay, some of this or oh, gost is gust. Okay, in German today, in English it's a different matter. Yeah, I choose the German for completion's sake. Right now, gust. Yeah, gost is. Okay, in English uh, it died out. Okay, yeah. Uh, so the now Grimm's law in completion. Okay, this is Grimm's law, all of it. Okay. Um, with uh, the interdental fricative being uh, missing from uh, the second line. But you can replace it, yeah? T turns into the. Uh, forgot about that. Um, uh, here, yeah? Grimm's Law. Um, a whole chain, we call this a chain shift, which means a whole system, yeah? A whole system, the system of plosives is uh, shifted one step. Uh, in Grimm's law. And uh, the big question is, why did it happen? Okay. And probably, where, where in this chain did it begin? Um, uh, uh, scholars still argue a lot about that. There were various theories. Uh, <laughs> thick lip theories, for example, yeah, that the Indo-Europeans uh, the Ger Germans later on, Germanic people, yeah, from Indo-European heartland and Germanic, that it was so cold uh, in Germanic lands that they couldn't move their lips anymore. And then if you pronounce a P and you can't move your lip because it's too cold, then it turns into P, 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 and then you arrive at F. Similarly, if you have a T and then T and then T, F, F. Thick lip theory. I mean, of course, this is completely disproven today, okay, things like that. Um, funny enough, but uh, it has happened. And uh, I can't repeat myself too often. I mean, the driving force be behind phonological change is simplification. And we should ask ourselves here, where is the simplification? Okay. It starts at some point where something is simplified because we are a lazy bunch, okay? We don't like to move our lips and our tongue, our speech organs and so on, a lazy bunch, and therefore, I mean, it's simplification. So most uh, uh, phonological change is due to simplification, reducing articulatory effort, we may say that, okay? Except for, for the few uh, exceptions where we try to be better understood. Okay, that's the other driving force. The simplification here is exactly at the first point, where there is a lenition, which means from p to f. Try it out. P, it's a lot. You have to blow up your lips. You have to let your uh, uh, cheeks explode and then say p. If you just say f, well, that's a lot easier, isn't it? Same is true for t. Yeah? If you don't, t, you need to, you have to put your tongue up to, yeah, your uh, uh, up to your alveola and then they did explode if you if you're lazy and don't put it up there it says a th, 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 th. simpler okay and then you do arrive at the antidental fricative which i left out by the way i mean said that okay replace it or um k, uh, if you don't put your tongue the back of your tongue up in the back of your throat k, you arrive at something like k, k, k. There is a simplification, okay? There's a simplification, the first point, from p to f, from, from t to th, from k to h. And this is my personal theory that it started there. And then those other b, d, g were pulled in to fill the vacancy, okay? And then b, d, g 
filled the vacancy they left. It would be a pull chain, okay? Which means first it starts with Pötöke leaving a vacancy and then the others are pulled behind. This is my personal theory. Pull chain. A push chain would be the exact opposite, yeah? That, for example, you start with B, D, G, they are unaspirated, and then because they clash with B, D, G, they have to move, and then the others have to move, okay? Because there's a clash in the system. I don't think this is very likely, although there are scholars still, of course, a lot of them, who prefer this theory. Um, uh, make up your own minds. I mean, just be aware of the problem, okay? This, uh, uh, this, this sort of Grimm's Law, first consonant shift, where did it start? Is it a push or a pull chain? There is a lot to say in favor of both theories, okay? But if you consider that simplification is the driving force, well, it must have started with a lenition, okay? With Pertuker being turned into fricatives, which would make it a pull chain. Uh, just uh, for completion's sake, okay, um, here, uh, um, an example, I mean, um, how this knowledge about yeah, correspondences between Indo-European and Germanic, okay, how this may enlighten us in order to understand the meaning of a word, semantic, yeah? semantics. Let, take this one here, picus, yeah, Latin means cattle. Okay, and this turned out into Old English feoch, very regular. Okay, if you have the Indo-European puk, yeah, which is preserved in Latin, so feoch. Okay, p into f and k into ch, and feoch later on became fee, payment. But pecos means cattle. So interestingly, I mean the knowledge about the first consonant shift makes us see the correspondence between pecos and phi, and then we may surmise, and it's easy to do that here, okay, that cattle was the penultimate way of payment. And uh, there's a lot to say in favor of that, and we'll come to that in the next sessions, yeah? that the Indo-Europeans were very much relying on sheep, for example. Okay, and uh, uh, so this is this sort of cattle was the payment, and that somebody who had a lot of cattle was a rich man, a woman, which is still true for some societies in the modern world. Okay, so cattle as the ancient form of payment with the Indo-Europeans. Okay, because fee means payment. Feoch in Old English meant payment as well. Okay, but it derives from cattle. And if you uh, look at, just uh, uh, for completion's sake, pecunia well, means money in Latin. Well, they have that. Payment with cattle is money. Okay. Uh, one more example of this kind. In all Germanic, in all languages, yeah, Germanic languages, Indo-European languages, new and nine are the same word. Okay, novus, novem, noi, noin, new, nine, and so on. Why? Well, because the Indo-Europeans, they counted with their fingers only. Okay, this is one explanation. Why is that that nine and new go back to the same root? Yeah, the number nine and the adjective new go back to the same root. And look at that, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, new hand. So nine and new becomes the same word because here you have a hand. They count it with their fingers only. And in all Indo-European languages, you have a word for thumb. Four fingers, one thumb. The thumb does not belong to the hand for an Indo-European. Just counting with his eight fingers. And this makes them having an octal and not a decimal system. Okay, and here you have comparison between octal and decimal okay the most likely explanation well it's not proven it's just interesting well, just interesting thought experiment what happens if you only count with your eight fingers and leave out the thumb because it does by definition thumb 
not belong to your hand. Okay, we'll take it from here.